All right, guys, this is my second reading of um, um, an essay from Marshall McLuhan, The Medium and the Light on Wyndham Lewis. And I did my first reading here, which I'll post uh, up up top here. You can check it out. And I was losing my voice at the end of it, so I'm going to start a little bit um, kind of into where I was ending in the last video. I find this character, Wyndham Lewis, I was not aware of him at all, extremely interesting. Um, So I hope you guys do too. So... He wrote a book called The Art of Being Ruled. I'm trying to find it on um, Amazon or Google or eBay. The only copies that they have right now are $120 plus. It's hard to really find, which makes it a little bit more interesting, I think, as well. So Wyndham Lewis wrote The Art of Being Ruled. And I'm going to start here with Marshall McLuhan talking about this book. And I'm going to continue reading. And I'm going to read through the footnotes as well, because that was almost the most interesting part here. So here we go. The art of being ruled is a study of the major dichotomy of modern life. There is a romanticized machine on one hand, the vulgarized spawn of speculative science committed to perennial and ever-accelerated revolution. On the other hand, there are traditional political and human values. Quote, The cultural all-around personage is the opposite of the narrow class man, or better, caste man. The narrow occupational mannequin, the narrow integral self-effaced unit of the symbolic. The bootmaker for the theorist of syndicalism must have only bootmaking thoughts. No godlike éclair. Gentlemanly thoughts must interfere with his pure, sutorial one-sidedness. Thoughts that, in any case, he would get all upside down, never have any time to properly enjoy, and which would only make him absurd and diminish his utility syndicalism specialism whether theoretic as in europe or actual as in america is the degenerate child of decadent scholasticism it is anti-vital anti-human perversely harnessed to it are the accumulated theological energies of many centuries the fanatics of revolution and applied or vulgarized science from Rousseau to Lenin are apostles of a distorted creed. As a result of these distortions, it has come about that, again, here's the long quote, in our society, two virtues are badly contrasted, that of the fighter and the killer. Given such immense prestige by 19th century Darwinian science and philosophy and that of the civilizer and maker. We confuse these two characters that we violently contrast. The effort in this essay is to separate them a little. It is hoped that certain things that have flown a gray and neutral flag will be forced to declare themselves as Osman or Aherman, the dark or the light. Close quote. Back to McLuhan here. Against the pseudo-impersonality and supposed quote-unquote, drift of events, Lewis asserts the prerogatives of human intelligence and control. He unmasks the long-preserved anonymity of supposedly unwilled and irresistible forces in modern life. The atomization of consciousness. Here's the uh, footnote from the atomization of consciousness. Uh, Lewis has shown at length how the fabric of modern life is woven without a seam. Quote, unquote, romance, advertisement, sensationalism, Bergsonism, behaviorism, pragmatism are all the same thing. The world in which advertisement dwells is a, is one day world. The average man is invited to slice his life into a series of one day lives regulated by the clock of fashion. The human being is no longer the unit. That was from Time and Western Man. And more from the footnote. For the Stein attack on language, which ensures the continuity of experience, I heard Ms. Stein give a lecture at Cambridge entitled, I am I am I because my little dog know me. That is, the only proof of the continuity of our personality must repose on our fitting into an external habit machine. Miss Stein's subtle attack on language is part of the child cult and the flight from responsibility. It is no accident that she was the star pupil of William James, the prince of pragmatists. Our schools of education in America have lapped Miss Stein on the behaviorist track. Teachers are now taught to abandon the stodgy ways of maturity. They are taught to, they are taught to enter the child's world 
by ingenious disciplines guaranteed to deracinate every trace of rational criticism in adulthood. One way we actually in use in use is to compel adult students to imitate loaves of bread for minutes at a time. The world of the child is the world of pragmatism, romance, make-believe, action, wide-eyed wonder, docility, tutelage, managerial revolution, and vulgarized art and science. Lewis treats all these things as respects of the, quote, the war on the intellect in The Art of Being Ruled, pages 392 to 409. Back to the text. The atomization of consciousness, the attack on the continuity of personal experience, whether by the medicine man of the laboratory or the Dionysiac ecstasies of advertisement and high finance, are alike shown to be the products of deliberate will. The worship of the dialectic of history or of the, quote, dynamic aspect of reality in Hegel, Marx, and Bergson has its natura natural corollary on the, quote, unquote, practical plane. Here's a quote from Wyndham. Uh, dynamical, as the most hurried of men is aware, means the bustle and rush of action, of big business, armaments, Atlantic hops, Wall Street, and Mussolini. A dynamic personality means, in journalism, an iron-jawed oil king in an eight-cylinder car, ripping along a new motor road, with a $100 million deal in a new line of poison gas bombs blazing in his super brain, his eye aflame with the lust of battle, of those battles in which the others fight and die. Now here's a footnote to that quote. Um, Time and Western Man, page 13. Hugh Gordon Porteous, in his useful Wyndham Lewis, cites a related passage concerning the procedure of Lewis. Here's a quote. Having laid bare the will concealed beneath the doctrine, we analyze it. When the doctrine is seen to flow from a not very beautiful will, by which it is pumped out by the gallon, the doctrine loses its importance automatically. Hence, if we have succeeded in some instances in discrediting the will, it is to be, ho is be hoped indirectly that we may have damaged the doctrine. Back to the text. Such are the results of confusing the quote-unquote fighter and killer, whether in the speculative or the practical order, with the quote-unquote civilizer and maker. For Lewis, therefore, there are two kinds of revolution. Quote, there is permanent revolution and there is an impermanent, spurious, utilitarian variety. Much revolutionary matter today is a mushroom sort, not at all, ed not at all edible or meant for substance. End quote. It is this latter variety pumped out from the lab into the pages of Reader's Digest which evokes the spurious reverence of the modern world. Man, the master of things, is about to enter the terrestrial paradise of gadgets. His heritage has matured through bloody revolution and awaits him. Quote, the heir of all the ages stands by the deathbed, penniless. The immensely wealthy society at its last gasp lies gazing, gazing listlessly across the counterpane, staring at a palm which stares back at him. The evening comes, the day has been spent in idleness. The heir of all the ages retires to his great and the neighboring inn, his, to his garret and the neighboring inn. The bulletin is issued, no change. Here is a footnote. There are reasons for thinking that the love, of ch love for change, which in our day is commonly supposed to be overpowering, and the capacity for it, for it which is vulgarly, vulgarly assumed to be infinite, are limited to a very narrow sphere of human action, that which we call politics. A man cannot safely eat or drink or go downstairs or cross a street unless he be guided or protected by habits, which are the long result of time. Back to the text. Equally fatuous with the quote-unquote revolutionary simpleton is the quote-unquote reactionary idiot of Charles Moros, Charles Maros variety. Quote, we listen to him for a moment and he unfolds his barren childish scheme with the muddle-headed emphasis of a very ferocious sheep. He lodges in the garret next to us at the inn and is in arrears with his rent. The servants, who are all the reddest of revolutionists, of course, hate him. The reactionary, in the long run, does not add to the cheerfulness of the scene. 
Lewis, confronted with the phony respectability of revolution today, asks Shui Buno, who benefits? Quote, the revolutionary of yesterday would at present find himself in the tamest situation, surrounded by a benevolent welcome at the millionaire's table, in the millionaire's press, as in the cabman's shelter or the labor journal. He would find nothing but the most respectable and discouraging conformity, the, that, the his eager beliefs. Everyone who has money enough is today a quote-unquote revolutionary. That and the dress suit are the first requisites of a gentleman. Footnote. Today, everybody without any exception is revolutionary. Some know they are and some do not. That is the only difference. Some, indeed, very many people actually believe they are Tories. They stay locked in a close embrace with the dullest form of revolution, convinced all the time that they are def defending the great and horary traditions of their race. Revolution is first a technical process, only after that it is a political creed or a series of creeds and of adjunct heresies. Back to the text here. Before answering the question of who benefits, Lewis exposes the non-impersonality of science. Here's a, this is a great quote here. Science is often described as the religion of industrialism. It is said to have provided man with, quote, a new world soul. Its public function is actually to conceal the human mind that manipulates it or that manipulates through it other people. For in its impersonality and its scientific attachment, it is an ideal cloak for the personal human will. Through it, that will can operate with a godlike inscrutability that no other expedient can give. It enables man to operate as though he were nature on, uh, nature on other men. In the name of science, people can almost without limit be bamboozled and managed. In passing, it may be as well to say that Darwin's particular evolutionary doctrine was responsible for an industrial type of thought rather than an agricultural. As it tended to reduce all intelligent organisms to things, men's thoughts and wishes to stones and sticks, it was easy for its followers to substitute motor cars and aeroplanes for sticks and stones. End quote. Consider how helpless millions of American parents are to protect themselves or their children from the quote-unquote scientific experiments in education initiated by a few individuals such as John Dewey. The vast American political machine of American education is directed not by thousands of scientific experiments, but by three or four minds of the most dubious quality. Footnote. The fact that the modern state is necessarily an educationalist state owing to a huge impassivity of the urban masses on the one hand and, the, and to the closely centralized control of all agencies of communication on the other does not prevent the teacher from being as much a victim as the pupil. Back to the text. Consider again how the press of the world imitates and promotes quote-unquote scientific detachment in its methods of quote-unquote impersonal news coverage. Yet nothing is more hysterically personal than news in its reflection of the human will. Time, life, and fortune put up an enormous front of detachment which upon slight examination proves to be violently emotional and interested. The hysterical voice of Winchell or the pompous melodrama of the quote-unquote March of Time program is a precise index to the impersonality of these agencies. It is therefore politically and humanly speaking a matter of the utmost concern for us to know from what sources and by what means the rulers of the modern world would determine what they do next. How do they determine the ends for which, as means, they employ the vast machines of government, education, and amusement? Lewis gives the answer that, quote, art and science are the very material out of which the law is made. They are the suggestion out of them are cut be the beliefs by which men are governed, close quote. So, uh, here's a footnote from that. Anybody who has had the opportunity to observe the workings of a modern university needs not to be told how the administrative policy of a great teaching body, such as in the, the ludicrous terminology, is a brainless submission to the currents of technological, not human, change. Catholic institutions provide no exceptions. It is Notable that Catholic educators in America follow along at the end of the procession of secular education, but they never break ranks. 
A slightly querulous submission is put in place of radical insistence on principles. Experiment along Catholic lines is done by Protestants or not at all. Back to the text here. That is to say, the rulers of the modern world are not detached or critical. They do not reflect. They do not consider ends. They are wholly immersed in the matter which they utilize without understanding of its character. That is why our rulers seem so harmless, such pleasant and charming homis moyen sensuals. Quote, that all your troubles come from that charming neighbor of yours, whose bald head you see peaceably shining in the early morning Sunday sun while he waters his lawn, who is always ready with a cheery word on the weather, the holy days, the cricket score. That is what is intoler intolerable. Footnote, the point is made when Lewis is considering the abysmal disgust of modern science with the quote-unquote imperfections of homo sapiens. It is the tone of indignation or of pedagogic displeasure that is the fault with the attitude of science towards man. But all these tones are adopted by a certain class of men who from no point of view have very much right to them. This class of men is not really detached from the ideal ideologic machine. They cannot much longer be neglected or resisted, rather, for they are now part of the great system of what the public wants. The rulers of modern society are increasingly identified with these technicians who control, quote, scientifically educational experiments and the Gallup poll. In reality, they are another genus of puppets, a genus of homicidal puppets, sure enough, and they bear a strange resemblance to the misanthropic masters of the doctrine of what the public wants. All right, back to the text. This sort of revolutionary simpleton, this beaming child of the zeitgeist, is precisely the sort of ruler the modern world cannot afford to have at the head of its enormous machinery. Lewis presents a massive documentation and analysis of the art and science and philosophy which manufactures the zeitgeist. The zeitgeist being the force which manipulates the puppets who quote-unquote govern us. It should be said at once that Lewis regards and has shown at length Mussolini and Hitler to be more perfect instruments of the antecedently prepared zeitgeist than, say, Mr. Churchill or Mr. Roosevelt. As a preparation for intelligent action, Lewis advocates self-extrication -extrica from the ideologic machine by an arduous course of detachment, the scrutiny of the philosophy of the past for centuries, four centuries as well as of the art and science which, which the, that philosophy has engendered. For success in this task, very few are well equipped today. Footnote. To understand how ideas succeed, you must first consider what that success implies, especially with reference to this particular age. You would have to ask yourself who these men are. Then behind that professional and immediate ring of supporters, the mass of people who blindly receive them on faith as helpless, confronted with the imposing machinery of their popularization as newborn children, they, too, would have to be studied and their reactions registered. It is only if you belong to that minority who care for ideas for their own sake, possessing a personal life that is not satisfied with the old clothed shop or its companion, the vast ready-made emporium, that this procedure will have any meaning from you, for you. It's end of the footnote. Back to the text. It is a truism to say that the last century has been one of materialism, but this fact embraces philosophers as much as philanderers. The scientists and the stockbroker today are alike materialists in that they have no detachment. They make no effort to criticize the total situation in which they find themselves. So with the ordinary artist and politician, they are immersed in matter, in their zeitgeist, and they call it timelessness, or they appeal to the, rev rel the relativity notion of all human action as an excuse for sinking deeper into the brainlessness of matter. Consider how the ideologic machine has gone to work with the phrase managerial revolution. Again, consider how calmly people accept food, which has no nourishment in it, and they pay extra for advertisements which tell them that some of the nourishment vitamins has been generously restored. The particular means by which Lewis has extricated himself from the ideologic machine of our epoch with its inevitable labeling process, liberal, socialist, reactionary, fascist, individualist, realist, romantic, extrovert, etc., is that of one of the painter's eye. 
There are, of course, other possible means, but his early scholarly approach to the history of art, and for 10 years before he became the leader of English art, Lewis had studied the history of art, had shown him how very unfriendly European life has been, at the best of times, to the production of good plastic art. In the course of a careful study of the vulgarization of European culture, which occurred in Shakespeare and the Elizabethan drama, Lewis makes a basic statement of the invariable situation of the sincere artist in Western civilization. There's nothing shocking or queer about the, mess, about the passage I'm about to quote. It represents the opinion of modern historians who have finally been able to confront the evidence of the art of other civilizations and, and other epochs. Quote, the flower of European civilization and the only portion of it that can hold its own for a moment against the productions of the East or of Asiatic or Egyptian antiquity is to be found in the Italian, Italian Renaissance. The schools of painting of northern Italy from Giotto onward contain scores of significant names, the rest of Europe only a handful in comparison. The power, for, the power and perfection of the Italian work has never been equaled elsewhere in Europe. But this great flourishing period of culture was still, as such things have always been in Europe, a kind of breathless dilettantism, dilettantism. with a pathetic haste and in a worldly competitive rush, these few generations of men trod on the heels of each other's achievements. They brought, to the, they brought to birth gigantic and disparate masterpieces, which had too little congruity with the life around them. Tintoretto would paint his huge canvases in two days, and these wall paintings are full of imposing architectures that did not exist and were placed in surroundings that they dwarf or that do not suit them. No sooner was some great task started than it was assailed, and the first man to whom it was given superseded, or he was presented with a baffling multitude of colleagues. St. Peter's in Rome engaged the intention from start to finish of such different personalities as Bermante, Michelangelo, Raphael, Cellini, Peruzzi, Sangallo, Fontana, Maderna, and Bernini. This haste gave the sudden Renaissance flowering the appearance of a theatrical entertainment, the society for which it was organized was not secure enough or deeply enough established to give it such an immemorial foundation as is required by the perfection by the perfect productions of such a culture as uh, that of China or Egypt. In the Baroque of the Jesuit counter-revolution, it lapsed without disguise into an immense theatrical display, hardly more solid than the scenery of a ballet or court entertainment. It rose frothing but, frothing but stark into a false imperialistic opulence whose charm was its grimacing untruth in which the beauty of vulgarity was patented and which we weakly parody today. Always these bursts of dilettante culture in Europe grow feebler and shorter. They are cut short by wars or a little shifting of the political center and they snuff out. The death or failure of a single individual is enough to give them a mortal blow wherever they occur. Their little attempt at civilization is played against an alien background, with whose life, progressively diminishing in significance, they have no connection. Close quote. Modern anthropology is likewise an important means of detachment used by Lewis. The findings of modern anthropology are subtly infused into the best art of our time. The Wasteland in Picasso's Jornica and in Stravinsky's Sacre du Printemps. How significant an approach anthropology offers to the student of Shakespeare, Lewis illustrates in The Lion and the Fox, pages 139. Today we know almost as much about anthropology as the Church Fathers. We are so accustomed to having the art of Western Europe discussed as though it were the inevitable fruit of our civilization or as though it were an affair dwarfing the art of other places that this causal, casual statement may seem perverse, perversely eccentric. In this, we are provincials both of time and place. Lewis is making a serious and considered statement based on a consensus of expert contemporary opinion. 
We must recall that it is only within the last 50 years that it has been possible to contemplate non-European art in any quantity or proportion. That is to say, in this, as in the matter of science and politics, it has been impossible for Europeans to be detached in their view of themselves until recently. Of course, medieval Europe had no illusions about itself since it was overshadowed by the brilliant Muslim culture, as well as by its ever-present image of ancient Rome. It thus had detachment forced upon it. Led initially, then by his training as an artist, Lewis won detachment from the ideologic machine. But in his practical life as a serious artist, he was buffeted and hindered in his work by participation in the World War and by the economic and political conditions which resulted from the, quote, colossal episode in the Russian Revolution, close quote. Sheer annoyance at first led him to study a hostile environment to see how he might the better accommodate his creative work of it. This led to some basic quote-unquote discoveries. In a world, not only was modern society hostile to art, but to life and reason also. Paradoxically, the machine has not stifened but melted life. Mechanism has imposed universal fashions of primitivism. It has rendered all the conditions of experience so fluid and frothy that men now are swimming in another flood. Quote, it is because our lives are so attached to and involved with the evolution of our machines that we have grown to see and feel everything in revolutionary terms. We instinctively repose on the future rather than the past, though this may not yet be generally realized. Close quote. This is the key not only to the modern cult of the child, but to the imitation of the dress, games, and manners of children among the well-to-do. Again, quote, science makes us strangers to ourselves. Science destroys our personally useful self-love. It instills a principle of impersonality in the heart of our life that is anti-vital. It is present, vulgarized condition. Science represents simply the principle of destruction. It is more deadly than a thousand plagues, and every day we perfect it, our popular industrially applied version of it. Close quote. Basically, then, a society which is hostile to art is hostile to life and and to reason. With this fact in mind, Lewis conducts an elaborate survey of the art, entertainment, science, and philosophy of the contemporary Western world to determine what is going on. Wherever one looks, one finds the vulgarization of the first rate into the shoddy and the sensual by a swarm of dilettante competitors who relay their degraded product to ever lower levels of drab sensuality. And now to answer the question, qui bono, who benefits? Who are, the benef- who are the beneficiaries of the modern world? Are they that tiny handful of people such as Lord Beaverbrook and Henry Luce who exercise absolute control over the thoughts and emotions of many millions of people? Confronted with the evidence of intimate correlation between the nursery politics of the Disney cartoon, the prose style of Gertrude Stein, the systemic a systematic attack on intelligence by Spengler, and the brainless primitivism of a Hemingway hero, the cult of Dionysism in Nietzsche, Bergson, and Planck on the one hand, and the glorification of impulse and the intense intestines by Gauguin, Freud, Lawrence, or Sherwood Anderson on the other. Confronted with such evidence, the first objection which is inevitable, inevitably put is this. Lewis posits a superbrain behind this facade. But no human intelligence could control so minutely such a vast complex of phenomena. Lewis, however, posits no such brain. Modern man, philosophically conditioned to sensation and its twin action, is automatically manifesting the fruits of that philosophy in a multitude of ways. Fanatically wedded to matter, he is giving an enormous inductive demonstration of the fact that matter has an appetite not for form as better, but for form as other. The constituted of create the constituted constituted of created being guarantees modern man that in seeking sensation and thrills, all his acts will uniformly possess a character of accelerated imbecility. Quote, but the man of action, low browed, steel jawed, flint eyed, stone hearted, 
has been provided, whether in mockery or not as aside from what we wish to prove with the philosophy. And it is some form of that time for time's sake philosophy, which we have already briefly considered. But this mechanical functional creature would implicitly possess such a philosophy in any case, since the dream quality of pure action must leave him virtually a child, plunged from one discontinuous, self-sufficing unit of experience to another, always living in the moment in moods of undiluted sensationalism. It is never the frantic servant of this doctrine of action who ever does anything, at least of use to himself. The superism, or whatever you like to call it, is only the most exaggerated, fanatical, and definitely religious form of the doctrine of action. Mussolini is, of course, the most eminent exponent of both. As a politician, he is only concerned with the usefulness of things. If you applied the conditions and standards required for the flowering, flowering of a Jack Dempsey to a Beethoven, say, you would be doing what is done in a more general and less defined sense at this moment as a thousand different activities mystically coalesce in response to the religion of merging or mesmeric engulfing. The intellect works alone. But it's precisely this solitariness of thought, this prime condition for intellectual success, that is threatened by mystical mass doctrine. Close quote. The answer then to the question of cri bono is ultimately this. Everybody loses. Society has been made into a machine, but not a pinball machine. There are no benefactor there are no beneficiaries. The Dagwoods and the billionaire power gluttons are equally rushing to the suicide of total immersion in the chaos of matter. However, they are not equally responsible. There is moral accountability in the profound cynicism of the Hollywood tycoons and of the Hart, Hursts and Henry Luces who, toba who toboggan us down the lowest level and biggest profits of what the public wants. But as the quote-unquote public becomes more deeply bored with quote-unquote what it wants, it turns not in wrath but with envy towards its tormentors. The exploited and the exploiter coalesce. Thus it comes about that the attack on the family, for example, which develops first in the 18th century as an attack on reason and the concept of authority, is conducted very thoroughly on the economic front as well. There is an intimate correlation of events, but no plan. The dynamic logic of, che of a cheap labor market naturally leads to an attack on the family. The only way to break down this expensive institution, which prevents half of the world women from being mechanically exploited, is to pitch women into the labor market, to force down men's wages to the point where homemaking, housekeeping, and child rearing is a luxury reserved for a small class. These elaborate activities, when carried on by the flat dweller, put an inhumane strain on him. He learns quickly to adapt himself to these procreation conditions and to lead an I-can-take-it existence of self-distortion and self-mutilation. The destruction of family life in theory and in practice, the flight from adulthood, the obliteration of masculine and feminine have all gone ahead by means of a glorification of those things. Never was sex so much glorified, children and motherhood so idolized and advertised in theory as, it, as at this present hour when the arrangements for their intermittent interment have been completed. Under socialism, parenthood is merely biological. It is like the courses in quote-unquote personality development for introverts, which are guaranteed to make everybody exactly alike. The same sort of paradox is seen in the fact that we have today maximum ins insistence on regional and national differences in direct proportion to the disappearance of all differences between the proletariat masses of Tokyo Berlin, Milan, Marseille, Manchester, and Chicago. Regional and national differences today offer at best decadent material for a peep show or travelogue. Quote, they no longer represent either a living culture or a political power. Close quote. The explanation of this paradox is simple. The intensity of mass control and exploitation is increased by the multiplication of superficial differences. Quote, Thus, if a man can be made to feel himself acutely A, an American, B, a young American, C, a Middle West young American, D, a radical and enlightened Middle West young American, E, a college edu educated, etc., etc., 
F, a college-educated dentist who is in et cetera, et cetera. G, a college-educated dentist of such and such a school of dentistry, et cetera, et cetera. The more flexible each of these links is, the, most, the more powerful naturally is the chain. Or he can be locked into any of these compartments as though by magic, by anyone understanding the wires. Close quote. Again, no plan or plot or superbrain is needed for the full intermeshing and exfoliation of all these things to proceed through innumerable changes and ever-increasing violence and intensity to their natural term. The dialectic of matter itself guides the brutalized mind into the labyrinth. Thus, the modern world proceeds through a dialectic, a dialectic of violence to the recents and privation of matter itself. That is the goal or limit which is automatically set for quote-unquote change and quote-unquote revolution. Beyond the century of the common man await centuries of ever more common men. Against this quote-unquote limit, Lewis always poses the limit of human excellence. His gaze is always fixed on the great achievements of individuals in philosophy and art who define the upper human limits. And within those rational limits, he indicates a good life which is characterized by, quote-unquote, sweetness and light, a tense equilibrium of our best interests and energies. In view of his advocacy and illustration of reasonable disciplines at all levels of human affairs, he is a conundrum to modern philosophers. He is not only extremely unpopular, but he is also quite incapable of being popularized. As Miss Rebecca West once said, Quote, there is no one who has greater acumen in detecting the kinds of contemporary thought that are not candid, that are mere rationalizations of a desire to flee towards death. Close quote. Taken simply on the merits of his pamphlets alone, he is the greatest political theorist and observer since Machiavelli. Even Machiavelli can be put aside him only in a point of accuracy of analysis, certainly not in respect of excellence of envisioned goals. For Machiavelli, like Marx, was not a free intelligence. He was enmeshed unconsciously in a particular situation against which he took a sadistic revenge. Lewis seeks no revenge beyond recapturing men for rational activity. He has no illusion about ever being influential or comprehended. And the final quote to close this out. I know that at some future date I shall have my niche in the Bolshevist pantheon as a great enemy of the middle class idea. My bourgeois bohemians in tar and oh, my apes of God will provide quote unquote selected passages for the school children of the future communist state to show how repulsive, unbridled individualism can be. Close quote.